Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to be looking at electricity today. And in this first lesson, we're going to be going through all of the basics of electricity that you should know from grade 10. And then adding onto it, we're going to be looking at the work that you cover in grade 11, which is adding in internal resistance, as well as adding in um, the EMF of the cell. All right, so without further ado, I'm gonna start on my whiteboard and we're gonna get going. All right. Okay, so way back. <laughs> the first thing that you should know is we did electrostatics a little while ago. And if you remember in electrostatics, electrostatics dealt with stationary charge. When we deal with electricity, we're now dealing with charge that is moving. So it is in fact moving charge. This is the same charge that we dealt with in electrostatics. So it's still shown by the symbol Q and it's still measured in Coulomb. Now, most of you are quite um, well aware of the fact that when we deal with electricity, we normally deal with electric circuits. And I promise you, we will be getting to electric circuits in the course of tonight's lesson. But before we go there, I want to just discuss a couple of things about the different, um, I guess, quantities that we deal with in electricity, as well as what you need in order for electricity to flow. So the first thing that you've come across before is the idea of charge. Charge is due to usually an absence or a shortage of electrons. It's got the symbol Q. Please note in the case of electricity, we usually use uppercase Q, not lowercase Q, but you can use either. Charge is the one variable that allows both. And it is measured in Coulomb. But we usually do not focus on Coulomb here because, um, sorry, that should be a C, because um, that's what we deal with in electrostatics. Please, once again, like in electrostatics, millicoulombs, microcoulombs, nanocoulombs, and picocoulombs, the smaller quantities of coulombs, may be what we're working with. So what we're going to start looking at is we're going to look at the idea of current. Some schools call this current strength. I find that internationally they call it current. And in the matric exam, we're usually pretty okay with calling it current as well. Current has the symbol I. It is measured in ampere. Please not actually amps. It's got a funny little thing on one of the E's. Uh, but you can get away with saying amps because we usually only write the letter A. So current is measured in ampere and we measure it using an ammeter. The symbol for an ammeter is that it's a circle with an A in it. I know some of you are thinking this is really easy, but we'll get there quickly. So current is defined as the rate of flow, the, that should not be there, the rate of flow of charge. So it is effectively how quickly the charge moves. So I use the formula I is equal to delta Q over delta T. Once again, uppercase or lowercase, technically both are correct. But I think on the formula sheet, if I just quickly have a glance at it, because I do have your formula sheet here, they actually rearrange this equation. And the version they have is Q is equal to I delta T. So that is the version on the formula sheet. I don't think you can see the formula sheet as I flash it up, but that is the version of this, which effectively links these two quantities together. And it says the charge is current multiplied by time. I see it the other way. I see it as being current or current strength is equal to the amount of charge in coulombs passing a point per unit time. Now, very important here, but I'm sure all of you already do know this, the time must be in seconds, which means that if we have anything in minutes or hours, you need to multiply by 60 and then multiply by 60 again you started with hours. So from minutes to seconds, you times by 60, hours to seconds, you times by 60 to minutes, and then 60 to seconds. So current is the rate of flow of charge, and it's how fast the charge is moving around the circuit. When we connect an ammeter, very important here, your ammeter must always be connected in series. There are two reasons why your ammeter must be connected in series. 
first thing is it's only going to be able to measure how fast the charge is moving through it if it's measuring the current that goes through it. You can't, I always use the example, I can't measure how many cars are going down and I'm in Cape Town here, so I'm picking two roads that are near each other. I can't measure how much, uh, how many cars are going down main road by sitting on campground road. They're two different roads. If I'm doing parallel branches, I can't measure the current through the first branch. So one of the biggest problems I find that people have, and sometimes it's one that I even find when I'm expressing things, where I have to then stop and say, no, you're using the wrong terminology, is that charge is what flows and current is how fast it flows. So if we say that the current flows faster, we're actually talking nonsense. It's the charge that flows faster and the current which is increased. So a little picture in your head that you're gonna find we come back to just now, is that our charge is like water and our current is how fast the water flows, okay? So when we have charges, the charges move and how fast they flow is the current. This formula is one that you need to be able to know. All right, so most of us at this point, when we talk about charge, hopefully know that the thing that's moving around the circuit are electrons. Now, I've got a quick question that I want to ask everybody. Where do the electrons come from? I'm gonna stop sharing for just a second. Who can tell me where the electrons come from? So we've got the electrons, they're in the circuit, they're moving. Any idea where they come from? Where are the electrons that move around the circuit? Okay, so I've got an electrochemical reaction in the battery. Does that mean that the electrons come from the battery? Do the electrons come from the cells? Anyone know? Anyone brave enough to tell me? Can I unmute yourself? I'm telling you right now, cells is not the right answer. Right answer. Yes, Bella? Is it when inside the battery, um, chemical energy is converted into electrical energy? That's what gives them the energy to move but it isn't where the electrons come from. So the battery gives the electrons energy to move, but it doesn't make the electrons. The electrons don't come out of the battery. The electrons, this is gonna surprise all of you, are found inside the atoms of the metal that make up the conducting wires. Every single particle that's made of a metal contains protons and neutrons in the nucleus and delocalized electrons. So those electrons that move around the circuit are found everywhere around the circuit. All of our connecting wires have the electrons. The electrons are already there. The cell does not produce electrons. It gives them energy. So I draw a weird analogy when I describe this, and I describe it going back to the example of water, like a pump. Imagine I have a water feature. If I were to ask you, where does the water come from? You're not going to go and say the water comes from the pump. The pump pushes the water that's already there around the water feature. In your circuit, the cell gives energy that pushes the charges that are already in the conducting wires around the circuit. Can I quickly ask, who didn't know this before? It's one of the biggest misconceptions. Everybody goes, the battery makes electrons. That's rubbish. Atoms have electrons. They're delocalized electrons in metal. And all that we do is we give them a push to make them move by having a cell that gives them energy. Brilliant. Okay, so some of you have already learned something new today, which is a good thing. The next thing that we're gonna look at is we're gonna look at um, what you need in order for current to flow. So in order for current to flow, the first thing that you need is you need a power source. Now, we're quite used to the idea that our power source would be a cell or a battery. But to be honest, it could be you plugging it into the wall and the power coming from Eskom going around your house and that's where it comes from. So usually it's a cell or a battery. The second thing, and I'm sure you all also know this, is that you need a closed circuit. So you need a closed path for that charge to leave the cell go around the circuit once it's been given its energy and get back to the cell. So those are the two requirements we have. Now, one of the things that you learned way back when that I'm pretty certain many of you have forgotten is that you also learned something, so I'm just gonna quickly draw a little circuit here, about which way conventional current flows. 
So our rule here is that conventional, I've got to pay attention now, conventional current, conventional current flows from the positive terminal of the battery or cell, in this case cell, around the circuit to the negative terminal. Now, this is not actually likely to be tested specifically in electricity. You're actually way more likely to get asked things about your conventional current when it comes to your electrodynamics. And you actually have to decide which way the current's going so you can do those funny things with your hand that we'll get to later. But for now, you need to know that the long end is your positive end and the short end is your negative end. I need to quickly ask one of my children to find me a pen so that I can show you my simplest little rule as to how I explain this, but I'll get there just now. So my conventional current goes from the positive terminal around the circuit to the negative terminal. That is the direction in which our conventional current flows. I always say long end, you can make a plus, short end, you make a minus. It's a silly little gimmick, but it works pretty well. Long end makes a plus, short end makes a minus. Now, when it comes to the charges that move around the circuit, we know that they're electrons. And electrons, we hopefully also know, are negative, which means that the electrons flow around the circuit from the negative terminal in the opposite direction to conventional current. Now, this is a rather crazy idea. The things that are moving flow in the opposite direction to that which we say that they're moving in. Does anybody know why this is the case? Does anyone know why it is that we say conventional current goes from positive to negative, but electron flow is from negative to positive? Any ideas? Please speak up if you do have an idea. Okay, anyone? <laughs> Am I asking tricky questions tonight? What actually happened is way back when, and they were looking at electricity, they being the scientists, they knew the charge moved, but they didn't know if it was positive or negative. They took a 50-50 and they got it wrong. But the nature of a convention is that it's agreed upon by everybody. So everybody looks at it and goes, this is how we're gonna do it. So we have a convention in South Africa. We drive on the left-hand side of the road. It doesn't mean that the Americans are wrong. It's just that we've all agreed that this is how we're gonna do it. So the idea behind conventional current is they weren't sure what moved. They took a 50-50 and then they said, that's what we're imagining to move. Now, technically, if negatives move in one direction, the absence of that negative moves in the opposite direction. So we can still imagine that positive charge is moving, even though it isn't moving. I always say to my students that imagine that as the electrons move towards the right, the gap or the space that they were in moves towards the left, and therefore your positive charge is the direction in which the gap moves. I can try and quickly draw a little sketch for this, but I'm not promising very much because it's a bit tricky for me to do these. So imagine for a second that we've got a whole bunch of spaces and then we got, and this is where I'm getting brave, a whole bunch of electrons in them. I'm gonna hope that I can move these without making too much mess. Uh, I need one more space. So if we have, we actually deal with this idea later, these, not well, not this year, but we talk about holes. So imagine, no, that's not going to work. No. All right. So we're just going to imagine that these electrons are in their holes because otherwise I'm not going to be able to move them <laughs> when we come up with good ideas, but our pictures are too small. So imagine that all of these little guys no, <laughs> are in the spaces. Okay. So the black circles, your space and all of these little electrons. No, this is not going to work. All right. So the idea that I wanted to show you, which isn't working very well here, is that if each of these electrons moved one across, so I'm just gonna pretend for a second, this moves one across, it then creates a gap here. And this then fills the gap. So our gaps now move from here to here to here. This electron moves this way, the gap moves that way, this electron moves this way, the gap moves that way. 
So if you imagine that you had a whole bunch of things and they were filled and each one moved one across, the empty space moves in the opposite direction. And I like to imagine that that is our positive charge that is moving, even though it isn't moving. You'll also notice with electrostatics, we define everything according to a positive charge. This is the reason. There was a convention where we decided that positive charge was it, even though it isn't, and that's why everything works around this. Now, just something that you need to know, although you do know it from electrostatics, the charge on an electron is 1,6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. It is possible, very unlikely, but possible, that they can ask you to use this equation over here to work out the charge and then ask how many electrons move a point, past a point. But once again, this, this really is grade 10 work, so it's very unlikely. All right. Can I quickly double check? And I know I am going very slowly, but I think some of you have already learned a bit today. Can I quickly check? Is everybody good with the idea of what current is, what conventional current is, and what you need in order for the charges to flow? Okay, that looks like a good number of you. All right, so let's go back to my whiteboard. I'm going to quickly clear everything off here. Please take a screenshot if you need one. Okay, so I'm going to clear all of it. Now we're going to move on to potential difference. Potential difference is commonly known or colloquially known as voltage. Now, please, voltage, you'll find even as teachers, every now and again, I slip and I talk about voltage, but you should use the word potential difference. It's very appropriate. I always point out that the difference between potential difference and voltage. Imagine just for a second that you know your principal's first name. I'm sure most of you that are in school know the first name of your principal. And I'm pretty certain that if you shouted out his name at him, he would turn around to look at you. But he definitely wouldn't have a smile on his face and it definitely is not the most appropriate way. So voltage is like calling your principal at school by his first name or meeting the president of South Africa and saying, hey, Cyril, okay? It's true, it's correct, it's, nobody's gonna get confused about who you're talking about, but it's really not super appropriate. So we rather refer to potential difference as potential difference. Potential difference has the symbol V and it is measured in volts using a voltmeter. Some people say voltameter, it's fine. It's shown with the symbol V in a, in a circle, and it is always connected, your voltmeter is always connected in parallel. One of the reasons that your voltmeter is always connected in parallel is that it has a very high resistance. And if you connected it in series, it actually functions as an open switch and nothing works. So if students ever put together circuits and they moan that things don't work, it's probably that they've connected a voltmeter incorrectly. In, um, in, par in series instead of in parallel, okay? So when we say in parallel, we mean it's connected across something. So if we, for example, have a lamp, all of these lines should touch, it will measure across the lamp. We'll come, to pretend, we'll come to parallel and series just now. So the definition of potential difference, I on occasion get lazy and abbreviated PD, Please don't ever do that in an exam, it's not accepted. So potential difference is the amount of work done in order to move one unit of charge or one coulomb of charge between two points in a circuit. So this equation is V is equal to W over Q, where W is either the work done or the energy transferred. So the difference usually when we're talking about work being done and energy being transferred is usually we talk about the cell providing energy to the charge as the charge moves through it and the amount of energy provided per unit charge, that's our potential difference. Although we give it a special name when we're talking about the cell, we call it the EMF, or the potential difference of the battery. 
okay? That's the same thing, by the way, when you worked out V theta cell for your um, galvanic cells, same thing, the voltage, okay? But once again, voltage, never say that in a test. So this is work or energy measured in joules, and Q is the charge measured in coulombs. This is your potential difference. I'll get to the question in a second. Difference, oh, I think I left a little off there, measured in volts, which are V. Okay, just quickly checking the question, trying to check the question. Okay, so there's a question here saying, could we replace W with F delta X cos, and it would be F delta X cos theta? Sometimes they have a question where you have a motor on a circuit and it's lifting a weight up through a height, in which case there's no restriction that they can't link this to your section on work, energy, and power. So there's nothing to stop them if they choose, but please don't do it in electricity as a standard thing, to say work is equal to F delta X cos theta. So it is possible if a motor usually is doing work that we can link it to this equation, but only if it's a, mo a motor lifting something up that we usually go in that direction, okay? Or we could, I guess, possibly link it, although I've never seen it done yet, to maybe something inside a car causing something to move a distance. But once again, I'm making that up, so it probably won't exist. Okay, so potential difference is the amount of work done per unit charge to move the charge between two points in a circuit. Key word here, or words, is amount of work um, per, yeah, it should be technically amount of work per unit charge. I did it here as to move one coulomb of charge, but it's amount of work per unit charge. So if your potential difference is high, you have to do a lot of work to move a unit of charge between the two points. If your potential difference is low, you've got to do less work. So whenever you think potential difference, I actually don't know quite what people think of. I think that the potential difference is one of those really messy sections where I think everybody's idea of what it is is a little bit warped, unless it's this version which is the scientific version. And I must admit, it's been so long since I had this one as my definition that I don't actually know what you guys think about it anymore. So the potential difference is how much work must be done to move a unit of charge. Is everybody happy with potential difference? Can I just double check here? Everybody happy with the idea behind potential difference and the equation? Fantastic. So we now move on to the next section, which is our resistance. Okay, I'm going to take you right back in with resistance to sections that they don't always check, but I always worry that they're going to test things that we aren't ready for. Now, resistance in an informal definition is an opposition to the flow of charge. So if something has a resistance, it's slowing down how fast charge moves. However, our formal equation for resistance is that resistance is equal to potential difference divided by current. So if I had to give a definition, I would say that it is the ratio of the potential difference difference to the current. So potential difference across a component to the current through it that would be what my resistance is. So resistance is measured in ohms, where the symbol for ohm is omega, like the Greek letter capital O, okay, uppercase O. And your resistance, quite often people get a little bit confused. Most people are very comfortable with the fact that you can calculate it using or rearranging the equation V is equal to IR, on your formula sheet, I just need to double check, the one that you get on your formula sheet is that one. So here, this is our potential difference. Measured in volts, this is our current. Measured in amps, over here we've got our resistance. Measured in ohms. So we can work out the resistance 
at any point in a circuit if we know both the potential difference and the current. I just quickly want to chat to you about Ohm's law because a lot of people get a little bit lost on Ohm's law, not in an important way, but in a way where um, sometimes you may limit yourself. So Ohm's law, and I'm drawing this very messily, please, these are all straight lines that are beautifully horizontal and vertical. If we have a graph and it's V against I, we plot our line over there, that is what Ohm's law is. So Ohm's law effectively says that the potential difference across a, now this is where people differ, it could be a component, a resistor, a conductor. I'm going to use the word component. So the potential difference across a component is directly proportional to the current through the component. Whatever it is, if it's a resistor, you may replace that with resistor. If it's a conductor, replace it with conductor. Provided that the temperature remains constant. So the basic idea here, and I want you to actually think about it very carefully, is the amount of work we have to do to move the charge through the conductor. If we give the charges more energy, there will be a larger current. So I like in my head to think about this using, I guess, the equivalent, the relationship that I is equal to Q over delta T, which says that if I'm giving the charges more energy, they will move faster. If they move faster, the current will be larger. Now, just a quick important thing to note here. From this relationship, we can say that the gradient of this graph will be change in potential difference over change in current, which means that we can usually say that this gradient here is equal to the resistance. But I need to correct that idea just slightly because a lot of people think that the gradient equals the resistance. And then if I gave you one point on this graph and asked you to work out the resistance, you freak out and you think you can't do it. Please, that isn't assuming that you can do the point zero, zero here. What you need to realize is you could take a read off here and here, plug them into that equation and work out the resistance from any single point where you know both the potential and the current. What this gradient actually does is it gives us the average resistance. It takes a whole bunch of values for the resistance, which is the ratio of potential difference to current, and averages them. So quite often when we plot a graph, it actually has the wonderful benefit of not only looking at one point, but looking at a range of points. So it actually gives us a very unbiased average. So when we look at a graph, we quite often are very quick to say, the gradient of this line represents the resistance. But we could have worked out the resistance even if we only knew one of the values. So it's actually that it averages or works out an accurate value. Please, following on from that, you need to make sure that when you do Ohm's law, you're looking at this graph very carefully because here the gradient will give you the resistance. But if we invert the graph, which we often do in tests, we can end up with a gradient here, which is actually the inverse of resistance. Also, with this particular graph, the steeper the gradient, the greater the resistance, and I'm going to use the word shallower, the shallower or flatter the gradient, the smaller the resistance. But the opposite happens with this graph. With this graph, if we go steeper, we've actually got a smaller resistance because it's the inverse graph. It's potential difference on the um, x-axis against current on the y-axis. And over here, if we go with, I'm gonna go with flatter this time. If it's flatter in a gradient, your resistance is larger. So please always be on the lookout for these graphs. And also remember that you don't actually need two points in order to work out the value. Any single one value of V and I should be able to get you the resistance. All right. 
Couple more important things on resistance. There are effectively, and I'm gonna stand corrected if I'm wrong on this, four things that affect the resistance of um, a piece of wire or a resistor. Before I write those down, can I ask everybody just quickly take a screenshot if there's anything that you need on the board, because I'm gonna clear it in just a second. All right. So we are now looking at the four factors that affect resistance. I haven't actually seen this being asked for a long time, but that doesn't stop the fact that it's one of those things that can pop up and totally hit you and blindside you because you haven't thought about it in years. The factors that affect the resistance are the length of the resistor, with the rule being longer equals larger resistance. So the longer a wire or a piece of a conductor is, the higher the resistance will be. The next thing is the cross-sectional area. Now, we're assuming over here that if we're talking about cross-sectional area, that we're actually talking about the area of the circle making up the cylinder, which we could call our wire. So technically over here, this bit here is our length, and this bit here is our area. And we often, instead of talking about cross-sectional area, use the rule of thicker and thinner. So the thicker the wire is, the, the lower the resistance, and the thinner a wire is, the larger the resistance. So often we don't use thin wires unless we want high resistance. If we want high resistance, then you can create it rather easily by using thin wires. The wires that they use to transport electricity around the country are deliberately quite a lot thicker because we don't want to generate too large a resistance and we don't want to lose energy as the, as the current flows through them. All right, the next thing here is the type of material. Now, um, you don't learn the word I'm about to throw at you, so please don't panic if you haven't heard of it, but the type of material affects the resistivity, which is a specific constant given to every different kind of metal. Now, you probably haven't learned about resistivity, but all of you hopefully know that as a rule, copper is a good conductor. So surprisingly, are silver and gold. So copper, silver, and gold tend to be good conductors. And they're good conductors because they have low resistance. The reason that we don't use silver and gold, usually for electrical wiring, is that it's really expensive. But in certain electronic devices, we use silver and gold because it's actually preferable to copper, but it costs so much more that you've got to have a situation where the end user can pay for it. Okay. Also in South Africa, let's be honest, if we used gold and silver in our electrical wiring, they'd disappear faster than copper does. The second thing over here is we're gonna look, so those were our good conductors. If we used nichrome wire, which is an alloy, alloy, I think it's of nickel and chromium, or tungsten, those are particularly poor conductors, so those make good resistors. All right, so just so you know, tungsten is used as a filament in your old light bulbs where tungsten would get really, really hot because of the resistance and it would glow right, bright white and it would give off light and those are what we used for our light bulbs. And nichrome you commonly find in your toaster. So if you think about a toaster and certain heaters, they have those thin wires that go back and forth and back and forth and you turn your toaster on, and they glow bright red. That's because they have such a high amount of resistance. So as current flows through them, it has a heating effect. So just a little point here for you to note, and that's that when current flows through a resistor, it makes it hot. So quite often when we're doing a circuit, once we take our measurements, we turn everything off and we let it cool down so we don't end up with a buildup of, or the, a temperature increase. Because as soon as we've got an increase in temperature, it changes our resistance, which is point number four. The last factor that affects resistance is the temperature. And one of the reasons on Ohm's law, it specifies that the potential difference is directly proportional to the current, provided that the temperature remains constant, is that if the temperature increases, the resistance also increases. If the temperature decreases, the resistance also decreases. Now, just a little note here. Sometimes they talk about a non-ohmic material, conductor, resistor. If something is non-ohmic, 
quite simply what it means, it, sorry, that shouldn't be R, that should be V and I, is that it doesn't obey Ohm's law. So what you may find is that instead of forming a perfectly straight line, so ohmic conductors will always form nice straight lines here, a non-ohmic conductor generally will have an increased resistance as time goes on. So a light bulb, for example, is a non-ohmic conductor because a light bulb, old school light bulbs at least, get hot. As they get hot, their resistance increases. And please remember that the gradient of this curve told you about the resistance. So over here, you can see it's got a lower gradient, higher gradient, higher gradient still. So that's typically what a non-ohmic conductor looks like. Non-ohmic conductors are usually only examined to the point of somebody saying, is this ohmic or non-ohmic? And you've got to be able to say, oh, it's not a straight line, it's not ohmic. All right. So up till now, we've looked at current potential difference and resistance. I'm going to quickly spend a little bit of time now. I think I'm undecided as to whether I look at power or I jump and look at series and parallel, but I think I'm going to start with power and then we'll get to series and parallel straight after that. All right, so quickly take a screenshot if you need one so that I can clear for all of the drawings. All right, now what I want to talk to you just before we have our break is I want to talk to you about work and power. There are a whole bunch of equations that you're given in this particular section on your formula sheet for work and power. I find the easiest way for me to think about work is W is equal to, um, sorry, V is equal to W over Q. This was our first equation where we looked at work. So what we can do to get our equations for work is quite simply to imagine rearranging this formula. And then we can arrange it a little bit further. Okay, so that is one of the equations we can do. So if we know the potential difference across something and the amount of charge moving through it, we can know how much work was done. And please remember, this is work done or energy expended. Um, just bear in mind that work and energy are effectively being viewed as the same thing here. If I re re replaced Q with I delta T, I can jump in here and I can say, well, Q is not Q, it's going to be V I delta T. And then if we use the equation V is equal to I R, which you've also seen today, then we get the equation I squared R delta T, also for work. And then lastly, if we go back to this version, because I kind of have to start from here, if I have the equation I is equal to V over R, which is me rearranging that, then I can go in here and I can say, well, there'll be a V there, a V there. So we get V squared over R delta T. Those are the different equations that you have to work out the amount of work done. All of these are given on the formula sheet, so you're more than welcome to use them directly. Or you can remember going back and working from the one to the other. Okay, when it comes to power, you hopefully remember from the section on work, energy and power, that power is equal to work done per unit time. So in order for us to be able to get those equations, power is going to be basically, let's start with that equation. We're going to divide it by time. So it's just V times I. The second equation is power is equal to I squared R. And the last equation is power is equal to V squared over R. So those are all of your equations for work and all of your equations for power. Please remember that when we do power, I'm just quickly throwing this in again, although we do know it somewhere, power is measured in watts and work or energy is measured in joules. All right, so quite often these are things that you're going to need or that we're gonna use. Can I quickly ask you to take a snapshot before I clear everything? All right, ladies and gentlemen, I quickly want to show one thing to you before we move on, and I'm hoping that I can find the right thing. There we go. And this is the formula sheet that we're gonna be using. So I quickly wanna show you how far through this we've already gone and then where we're going next. So we've looked at this equation under Ohm's law. We've looked at all of these equations for work and all of these equations for power. And we've looked at that equation for charge and current. I haven't yet looked at working out resistors in series and parallel, but that's what I'm going to get to now. So now what we're going to look at is how we connect components in series and parallel 
how we then work out potential difference in series and parallel, how we work out current in series and parallel, and how we work out resistance in series and parallel. After that, hoping there's still time, we're going to move on to this last equation over here, which is the equation where we look at our EMF and our internal resistance. We're gonna be focusing mainly on this equation when I see you again on Thursday, but I need to make sure that we've kind of built up enough knowledge before then so that everybody understands what they're doing. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're halfway through our time. Can I ask you just quickly to stand up and have a quick stretch so that we can have you all nicely refreshed when we um, come back in just a second and we carry on with the rest of this. Okay, please don't disappear. All right. <laughs> I can see some of the pirates having a jolly good, um, I can only describe it as a jig. <laughs> uh, you guys are priceless today. I actually think I almost need, just wait a second. I need to just wait a second, pin you. There you go. We've got you guys on big screen now. You can pin you each individually. You'll be, the, you'll be immortalized. There we go. All the pirates. <laughs> There we go. All right. <laughs> I'm going to go back and try and find myself. There we go. Back to me. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, we're now going to be looking at series and parallel. I find that the easiest way to represent this is to have the two columns running next to each other. where You kind of look at what's happening in each of them at the same time. All right. So let's get started. So I'm kind of going to imagine down the middle of the page, I'm dividing this. You don't have to imagine a divide, just kind of makes it a little bit easier sometimes for your, your brain to digest it. So on this side, I'm gonna be looking at what happens with series circuits. And on this side, we're gonna be looking at what happens with parallel circuits. All right, so when components are connected in series, for me, the biggest thing is that there is only one path for the current to flow through. When we deal with parallel circuits, there are two or more paths for current to flow through. I find quite often when I ask students what the difference between series and parallel is, they kind of do this. They, they kind of want to describe it in terms of they're next to each other and they're across from each other. And that's true in terms of what we see. But you've got to be very careful because quite often I can draw things that look like they're in parallel, they're actually in series. Or things that look like they're in series, okay, they're looking like series, but they're actually in parallel, gets a little bit tricky. There was an incredibly nasty question done last year in the prelims most of the, the, I think it's Metro Central schools. And it was a horrible question. When I say it was horrible, it took me sitting with an electrical engineer to, well, an aeronautical engineer, an electrical engineer for about half an hour for me to figure out why the, why the components were connected in parallel and why they weren't. And it was horrendous. So you've got to be very careful with these. Good news is I'm going to show you that sneaky one so it will never catch you again because I have a sneaky suspicion it's going to be their new lucky little exciting thing to throw into your paper. So when components are connected in series, we usually draw them as being connected one after the other. When they're connected in parallel, we usually draw them as being branched. So I find the important thing to see if you're looking for series or parallel is if they're in series, all of the current goes through here, all of it goes through here, all of it goes through here. As soon as we've got parallel, there's a junction, and at this junction, the current has to go three ways, okay? When the current rejoins, all of the current comes back together and leaves off together. So that's the most important thing in terms of defining series and parallel. So here, if I were to pretend I put an ammeter here, and here, and here, and here, or we even spoke about the current through each of them, I can say that, and I'm not going to use I, I'm going to say, sorry, I'm not going to use A, I'm going to say I1 equals I2 equals I3 equals I total. 
basically there is the same current at all points. Here we use the rule that our total current branches and the total current coming in, let's say that I said that this were three amps, the total current coming in will be the sum of the current through all three branches, but each branch will get less than the total current. So if I have one amp going here and 0.5 amps going here, I must have 1,5 amps going that way. Also, when the current rejoins again, at the end, we must end up with three amps coming back out of it. So because all of the current flows through here, one amp will flow through the whole way through the branch, 0.5 amps the whole way through that branch, and 1,5 amps, that's a 1,5 amps, the whole way through that branch before they rejoin. So when we talk about parallel circuits, we say that they are current dividers. I don't really like to use the word dividers because it often gives you an idea that we're dividing instead of adding, but that's the terminology that we use. Okay, when it comes to series, we talk about series circuits as being potential dividers. They divide the potential. And the idea here is that if I looked at the voltage across all three of these, it would be the sum of the voltages across each of the individual components. Now, if you go back to what I told you a little bit earlier about potential difference being the work done per unit charge, this makes sense. The work done to move from here to here is the sum of the work done to move from here to here and here to here and here to here, okay? So when we talk about them being potential difference, the total voltage is, volt is the sum of all of the individual voltages of all of the different components that are connected in series. In parallel, on the other hand, the total voltage, which would be the voltage maybe if I measure across everywhere, is the same as the voltage across any one of these components. Every single one of these components will have the same voltage or let me rather say every single branch will have the same voltage. If I had two resistors in one of the branches, then I'd have to make sure that when I talk about them being the same, it's across both of them for it to be the same. It can't just be across this one or this one. This, the voltage across the whole branch must be the same. So this will be V1 plus V2 plus V3. And obviously if we had more, we'd have to deal with that. All right, I'm just quickly checking. There was a question. Um, all right, so we'll, I've just had a quick question. Please note, I don't actually think at this point that this symbol will be accepted as a resistor. This was a resistor when I was in school. In 2008, possibly even before, they took it out and they replaced it with a nice, easy to draw on a computer symbol. So at this stage, I can't tell you but I'm almost certain that these symbols will no longer be accepted. I mean, I, I'm gonna tell you as a safety thing, don't, it's wrong, okay? But whether that actually penalize you, I can't tell you, but I'm pretty certain that they might. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, thank you. Somebody told me that I'm writing this down nonsense and I am. These have to be equal signs. Yes, that's what I said and then I didn't do it. They're all equal to each other, there we go, okay. So that's all sorted. Um, there we go. Yeah, so those are all equal signs. Thank you. Just quickly, sorry, my brain got distracted by this question. I'm going to ask, I'm going to come back to you on it. So if you're here on Thursday, I'll make sure that I answer that question there because I can actually go and check with the person who does the marking of physics and knows the answer because they decide the rules. And they'll be able to tell you from the highest ranks whether or not it happens. All right, so here we have our current dividers but our potential stays the same or our potential difference is the same. Rather equal. And here our current is equal. All right, now we move on to the last part here, which is our resistance. When you add components in series, the total resistance increases. So the resistance in series is R1 plus R2 plus R3. Please, you may not use lowercase r here. Lowercase r will mean internal resistance, so you can't use it. So resistors connected in series, you sum them together. And basically by having more resistors connected in series, 
the total effect of resistance goes up. Resistors in parallel is different. It is the inverse. So the inverse or the reciprocal of the total resistance is the sum of the individual resistors. You'll notice here I've done everything for three resistors, but if there were only two, we don't have to go that far. Now, I know that some of you were taught a weird rule for resistors in parallel where I think you, what do you do? You add them on the top and you multiply them on the bottom. Please note that rule only holds if you've got two resistors. They give you three and you're doing them in parallel. You've got to go back to use this formula. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I want to quickly cover one important thing on parallel resistors and then we're going to move to actually do an example. So if I look at parallel resistors here, the important thing that I need to know is that the total effect of resistance of a parallel combination is always, no exceptions, always lower than the lowest component resistor. Now this is actually quite a powerful thing to say. That is saying that if I added together, I don't know, a three ohm, a six ohm and an eight ohm, the effect of resistance must be lower than three. I have a weird way of thinking about resistors in my head that I think makes a lot of sense for everybody in terms of understanding how they work. So when I imagine resistors in series, I imagine going to home affairs. You cue to get the form. You cue in a line to get someone to stamp a form. Then you cue in a line to pay for the form. You cue, you cue, you cue. The total amount of air and queuing that you have to do, effectively the time that you spend queuing as a measure of your resistance, or the total effect of resistance gets bigger and bigger and bigger as we do things in series. So if I ever imagine series, it's home affairs. It's queue, then another queue, then another queue. Parallel is there multiple options and you only go through one. So I imagine parallel being like you go to the shops and then you have to pay at one of the tills. You've got a queue often to pay at one of the tills. Now imagine you're in a queue and suddenly somebody opens up a new till. They're effectively adding another resistor in parallel. All of you hopefully will be able to imagine here, if someone opens up a new till, your weight will be less. So by adding another resistor in parallel, the total resistance goes down. Also, the weight that you have will be shorter than if you had to go even with the most competent fastest of the tellers. So if we're talking about the lowest component resistor, that's the fastest teller. And as soon as there are two tellers, you wait for less time than you would if you only had the one teller open. So even if you had the fastest, most competent teller, it suits you better for there to be multiple tellers open, multiple resistors, because it lowers the total resistance. So I find in my head, whenever I try to imagine resistors in parallel, that's what I pick on, because it quite often gets a little bit complicated for people, that we talk about the idea of that if you add a resistor in parallel, that the total resistance will decrease. And that if you remove a resistor in parallel, the total resistance will increase. Now, maybe paying at a shopping, at, at, at a queue in a shop doesn't involve you having quite as much resistance. But if you want to imagine an, another example, imagine licensing a car. I don't know if any of you guys have ever had to go through a licensing queue. When those guys go on lunch, effectively removing a resistor in parallel, everyone freaks out because suddenly they know they're going to have to wait longer. Even though, yeah. So you've got to remember here that queuing for something can be viewed as being a resistor. All right. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm just quickly stopping here. Can I double check? Is everybody up to speed with me? Everybody up to speed? And then probably more importantly, okay, I'm going to wait for your hands to come down again. 
probably more importantly, has everybody learned something new today, even if they thought they knew it pretty well? All right. Well, not so many of you. <laughs> All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, what I'd like to do now, if everybody's good with it, we've got another half an hour left, is I'd like us to spend a little bit of time doing actual circuits, where I ask you to calculate values, look for things, manipulate a circuit. Only once I'm happy that everybody can do that, do I plan to then move on to introducing internal resistance and EMF. Internal resistance and EMF are a tiny step up from being able to work with a normal circuit. And if you can't work with a normal circuit, then throwing in extra complications isn't going to make it any easier. All right, so let's get started. Quickly take a screenshot if you want anything that's here. And then I'm going to clear everything off here. All right, now I'm going to draw I'm not, maybe I'm being li a liar if I say this is a simple circuit. I'm going to deliberately draw a nasty circuit. You guys are in matric. Okay, so I'm going to put an ammeter there. It's a nasty circuit, but I must be honest, it's a grade 10 circuit still. At least it's a grade 10 circuit at my school. It's a mean one. All right, so we're starting nice and easy over here. Actually, maybe I want to put in a little bit more. I'll put in another ammeter. So we're going to call this just A, and that's A1. In an exam, they can choose what they want to call things. I'm going to tell you that that's 5 ohms, 6 ohms, and 3 ohms. Actually, no, let's make that 4 ohms. Okay, and I'm also going to tell you here that uh, we've got a voltmeter across the cell. And I'm going to tell you that the current that we have flowing through the circuit is one amp. All right. So the first question I'm going to ask everybody to do, please, and I want you to try this. I'm sure at this point you can do it reasonably well on your own. If you can't, I'll be giving you the answer in just a second. The first question I'd like you to do, oh, I'm terrible. I always leave switches off. There's a switch. I'd like you to please calculate the total effective resistance. of the circuit and i am putting in two quick provisos here the provisos are that there is no resistance in the connecting wires the ammeter has no resistance and the battery has no resistance so we're not yet dealing with internal resistance in emf all right i'm going to quickly pause my screen while i do this can i ask all of you to give it a bash right now go for it All answers to a minimum of two decimal places. All right. Can I ask if you've got the answer? Give me a thumbs up. Okay, good. Good, good, good. All right. Just quickly checking who's here today. All right, brilliant. Okay, let's go back to this. So, I got an answer here of 3,33 ohms. Can I quickly ask who got the same answer? 3,33 ohms? Who mistakenly got confused about what was in series and what was in parallel with what? It's a common mistake that people make. So you have to realize that the four ohms and the six ohms are in series on the bottom branch. The five ohms is on the top branch and that we have got effectively this going around here. So our current's gonna go this way. Well, let's check and be careful from the positive. Our current's gonna go this way and split and some of it'll go that way. We're being 100% correct going with conventional current in the right direction. So the total effective resistance is um, 3,33 ohms. Can I ask you all please for question two to calculate the reading on the voltmeter across the battery? 
So calculate the reading on the voltmeter. Okay, I'm gonna quickly pause and I'm gonna give you a chance to do the same. All right, if you've got the answer, thumbs up again. Okay, good. Okay, fantastic. So I've got a question. Ma'am, how do we get R2? All right, so I presume just quickly here that the person that asked that question, there's my answer to the other one, was wondering about how I got this value of 10. It's because if I follow the current through here, the six ohms and the four ohms are actually connected in series. Can you see that if I follow this line the whole way through, there is an unbroken path. So even though I've drawn it at the top, there's no difference to if I move that four ohms to over there. It's just that I've drawn it in a slightly different position to make it look a little bit complicated. It isn't really, but they like doing things like this to catch out the students who see those two being in parallel and get confused as to what the four ohms are doing. By the time you hit matric, that shouldn't be the case anymore, but it doesn't mean it's necessarily the case. I know that there are a lot of people where um, electricity is the one section that they hate. And usually that's the case if you don't quite get these things because maybe you've never properly understood them. All right, have I answered your question? Does that make better sense? Just need to make sure that I'm not leaving anybody behind. Okay, so if, if the person was asking, how do you get R2? It's those two. All right, calculating the reading on the voltmeter. Now the voltmeter connects across the, the cell so effectively for this, we need the total voltage, the total current, and we can use the total resistance. So I may use the total resistance here with the total current to get the total voltage. Please, you can always use this equation V is equal to IR, but you must be talking about the same portion of the circuit. We can't mix and match the current from only one branch with the voltage from the cell. That doesn't work out. Then, you, then you're mixing and matching things that don't go together. All right, so this voltage total is the voltage across this component, but bear in mind these two branches are in parallel. There's a tiny little hint there. The last question that I want you to do right now on this one is I'd like you to please calculate the reading on a meter A1. Okay, I'm going to quickly pause while I work it out. Calculate the reading on A meter A1. careful of your rounding. All right, quickly give me a thumbs up if you got that value. Good, it should be smaller than one, you should know that because we should effectively end up with the current through both branches adding up to one. I'm gonna assume I can nearly share. All right, so the answer that I got was 0 0.67 and I'm gonna quickly run you through this. So. If the current, sorry, if the voltage across the, on the, on the voltmeter here was 3,33 volts, that is the same as the voltage across this branch. So this will also be 3,33 um, volts. And in fact, being honest, if we connected it the whole way across both of those, we could get a voltmeter there that's also 3,33 volts. Please, it's got to be across both of them at the same time. So. Then I said, well, I'm looking for the current reading. 
I know my potential difference is 3 comma 3, 3, because they're connected in parallel. I know that my resistance is five. So current is equal to potential difference divided by resistance. In the Western Cape, we're allowed to rearrange our equations. Please be careful if you're in another province. Um, I know years ago I had somebody when I, when I taught in Joburg telling me that if you rearrange the equation and they weren't exactly on the formula sheet, you would not get the marks. Um, so please just be aware of that. But I know that in the Western Cape, they do allow you to rearrange them, provided you do it correctly. All right, so our reading here for this branch is 0,67 amps. And that tells us that the current flowing through the bottom branch would end up being 0,33 uh, 3 amps because those two must sum back to my one amp of current over there. All right, so there's a question saying, ma'am, is the ratio method to, to find the current flowing through a resistor still accepted or should we use Ohm's law? They do accept ratio methods in almost all steps as long as you get it right, okay? So some of you may have looked at this and said, well, there's five on the, the top branch and 10 on the bottom, and therefore there's an inverse ratio of how much goes through both. If you use a ratio method provided that you show how you do it neatly, you should get the marks, but just be aware of the fact, I'm suddenly thinking that there may have been a mark for the formula that you could have missed out on, but I, I don't actually think so. My, my experience is that if you can do things using ratios, they're usually pretty accommodating. All right, um, but I guess you may have needed something there. So I'm gonna have to double check on that one as well for you. But my guess answer is you're probably safer. I always feel more comfortable using this because then I can go formula, substitution, answer with units. They're my three marks and I'm good. Now, I wanted to quickly throw in another question here just to make sure that we've answered this in its entirety, okay? So I want to ask you, if I connect a voltmeter across just the four ohm resistor, what is the reading on this voltmeter over here? So I'm gonna go and put the question a little bit messily all over the place. But your question here is to please calculate the reading on V1. Okay, I'm going to quickly pause and give you a chance to do so. I'm using the slightly rounded up version. If you're using the direct version, don't, don't get too grumpy that it doesn't work exactly. Or that mine is gonna be slightly different. A thumbs up when you've got it. Okay, good. Good, good. All right, so what we had to do here, do you remember I told you before that if that was 0 0.67, this would be 1.33? It's probably not a bad idea to show somewhere that the current, I don't know, current total is current one plus current two. You don't have to do the formula. I'd go and say here that um, one minus 0 0.67 is equal, amps, amps is equal to 0 comma three, three amps, maybe, but you didn't really have to. And then through the four ohm resistor, we know the resistance, we know the current, so we can work out our potential difference. If we also wanted to work out the potential difference across this portion here, what we could then do is we could go and say, well, the, the voltage, the, the potential difference across both bits is 3.33. If this one has got 1.32, then the other one must have the balance, which means that this voltage is gonna be 2,01 volts. So hopefully this has kind of refreshed just a little bit how your potential difference, how your current and how your resistance works in terms of doing our calculations. This is a very nice straightforward question, the kind you actually hope for. Um, you're probably gonna get much harder questions, but it's just to kind of bring you back into the questions and to make sure that you understand how they fit together. Now, I promised you a little while ago that I'd show you the really nasty how we connect to things. So I'm going to do that right now, okay? So I'm gonna quickly clear all my drawings and then I'm gonna show you a component. We're gonna actually discuss how these components are connected. This question was asked in the paper, the, the kind of prelim paper that went out to all of the students. 
And it said that we have got three identical resistors, R, R, and R. And we connect them as follows. And the question here, so this is how we've connected them. And the question here from one end to the other end, I guess we could do it either way. I could ask you here with this, and we could put in different switches. So sometimes they may have different switches. I think in this particular question, they had a switch there and they had a switch there. And then they asked you, how have we connected these components? Now, many of you initially looking at this would probably say that they're connected in series. Can I ask just a quick show of hands? Who says that they're all connected in series? Who looks at it and thinks they should be connected in series, but I've now told you that there's a catch. And you're like, no, they're not connected in series. There must be something funny. Can anybody see? I know this is, takes a little while. Can anybody see that these three resistors are actually connected in parallel? They actually look like this. It's the weirdest one, and I promise you I saw this last year for the first time, and it blew my mind a little bit. It took a little while for me to see through it. It even became more of a contentious issue because we were then fighting about how many of them were in parallel. And I was adamant that it was all three, and we did the maths later, and it was all three. But some other people were of the opinion that there were only two. So they said that they were connected in parallel, but it wasn't just two in parallel, it was all three. Now, I want to quickly explain to you how it is that these three are connected in parallel. Now, the first thing that you need to know is we often say that current will take the path of least resistance, okay? So most of you will appreciate that given a choice of a, um, what effectively we, we term here, um, oh gosh, what's the word? What's the word I'm looking for? A short circuit. Given the choice of a short circuit, or going through a resistor, current would choose to go the short, short circuit, could go through the path of least resistance. So most people would see quite comfortably that the current comes here, goes through the short circuit, and then goes through the resistor. So they can quite comfortably see that one branch. What you've got to remember is that current doesn't quite work on an I approach a boundary and I see this way and I see this way. Current can see the entire path right the way to the end. It's like it's got superpowers. So if another path has an equal resistance that's also only R, then that path would also be an alternative. So current isn't literally going to be able to see easy path, difficult path. It sees right to the end because it can actually see how fast the charges are moving. So the second path starts here goes through the one resistor and then takes, why is this not going to work for me? There we go, okay, it will. Goes through here and then comes out. That also has a resistance of just R and we're going to pretend for a second that that's that one. Then comes the hardest one to see. The current is going to go through here and then go through this resistor. It's got no reason to choose this one over this one. We don't, current doesn't necessarily go, oh, I must go towards the right because everybody reads towards the right. If we go this way, the current goes through this resistor, then takes that short circuit and leaves out there. And that gives us the third branch over there. So at any one point, the current will only go through one of the three resistors if both of those parts of the circuit are closed. It is a very sneaky question, and I'm pretty sure that many of you appreciate that if you were given this for the first time in an exam, not having seen it tonight, it may have been a much harder question for you. So just bear in mind that the current can see till the end of the path. It can see all the way through. It isn't going to make a snap decision based on right now. Okay, It's long term. So it can actually, and I use the word see, please don't describe current as seeing, um, but it can, the path or the entire resistance is known because of electric fields and other fancy magic things. All right, can I quickly ask, who understands what I just did now? Did it make sense when I showed you the different paths and that all of them have the same resistance? It is a very tricky thing because I can promise you 
um, if it makes you feel any better, I saw it and then I saw the memo and then I was, I was marking it last year and I saw this and I saw the memo and I was like, uh-uh, this is wrong. <laughs> this is wrong. I can see the one path, but it took forever sitting with an engineer who literally was putting pluses and minuses on the ends of all the components to work out which way they were going. So now that you've seen that, hopefully, if I, I think all of you are now hoping that they'll give it to you because you'll be able to see what's going on there. As I've mentioned, that's a really, really nasty question. And we've got a few more minutes, so I do want to spend a little bit of time now. I don't think we're going to get on to EMF tonight, but I want to spend a little bit of time talking to you about how we measure different things and how they're going to catch, catch you out. So let's quickly go back to do an example, another example. This is one of our favorite testing examples that we put on worksheets, is we like to put weird questions where we connect voltmeters across switches. I don't know quite why it happens, but it's, it's one of those like really weird things that happens on occasion. So I'm gonna have a switch there. I'm gonna have a resistor here and I'm gonna have a resistor here. Now, I wanna quickly chat to you now about what voltmeters measure and when voltmeters measure what they measure. So the first thing that you need to know is that if current is flowing, there are only two options to calculate your voltmeter reading, okay? So if current is flowing, the equation to work out your potential difference uses V is equal to IR. That is the only way to do it. That means that if we have a voltmeter connected across something where nothing is happening, then at that point, that voltmeter can read zero. So if the resistance or the, volt, or the, the voltmeter is connected across something where there is no resistance, then the potential difference also equals zero. Think about it. If there's no resistance, you don't have to do any work to move the charge across it. No work is done if there isn't a resistance. But if the current is not flowing, then there are two options. Number one, it can either read the EMF, that's an M, so it can either read the voltage across the cell, or if it can't connect across the cell, it reads zero volts. So in this particular example, I've got two resistors, V1 and V2. I'm gonna tell you I've got a cell of EMF 24 volts, and I'm gonna call it EMF right now because we're not caring about internal resistance or anything fancy like that. So let's in fact say here that the internal resistance is zero for now. So if we have an open switch, which is what we have here, who can tell me right now what the reading on voltmeter V1 will be? So if we've got an open switch here, what will the reading on voltmeter V1 be? Okay, I've got someone typing in. They've said it'll read zero, okay? I'm gonna tell you it doesn't read zero. If we have got an open switch here, this voltmeter reads 24 volts. We're going for the option, if the current is not flowing, which comes from our open switch, we've got an open switch here, then the current isn't gonna be able to go around the circuit through our components, but I can connect this end of the voltmeter to this end of the battery, and I can connect this end of the voltmeter through either one of the resistors, it doesn't matter, or the parallel component, all the way back across the other end of the battery. If I connect the voltmeter across the battery, even if there isn't anything else connected, I can read the EMF of the battery. So here, this voltmeter will read 24 volts, okay? But let's now look at a slightly different thing. Same scenario, the switch here is open, what will this voltmeter V2 read? So the very important thing is it will only read the EMF if you can connect, as I showed you, I literally do this with my fingers, from the ends of the voltmeter, I go and I see if I can join up to go across the battery. So here, this voltmeter here, I can connect it there, 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 and then we hit a stop. This side here, I can connect all the way back. The point is, because there's that gap, I cannot connect this voltmeter and measure the EMF of the battery 
So this one will read zero volts. So these two scenarios are with the open switch, which means that the current is zero. Now we're gonna change the scenario, okay? So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna close the switch. I probably shouldn't be doing this to go backwards, but that's gonna help me to get there eventually. There we go. So I'm now gonna go and close the switch. Magic, simply go and close it here. And I'm now gonna ask the same question. What is the voltmeter reading on V1 and V2? Now, I could give you a specific value here, but let's be honest, we actually can work out what that one is. Who can tell me what the reading is now on V1? Anyone? So remember, we're now back to the current is flowing. So we're gonna use V is equal to IR. Any ideas for what the current, the voltmeter reading is on V1? Anyone? In the interest of us having two minutes left, I'm gonna tell you it's zero volts. So this was 24 volts before because it can measure all the way back and measure the EMF. But now that there is a current flowing, it'll read zero volts quite simply because there's no resistance. No resistance across the switch, therefore it's not gonna read anything. Now this is a bit of a weird one because if we'd had any other component in here, the answer wouldn't be the same. But here, all of the voltage of the battery is going to go across this parallel component. So that means that in this case, what we'd probably do is we'd get the current, we'd get the resistance, and we'd go and use V is equal to IR, and we'd calculate the value here. In this case, because we've effectively got a parallel in series with the 24 volts, this reading will actually be 24 volts as well, because we're not going to be doing any work anywhere there, or there, or there, or there. It's only the parallel components that will read, and because they're connected in parallel, both the bottom and the top branch will get 24 volts. All right, so this is one of those questions that pop up every now and again, where they start asking you, what will the voltmeter read? And if you're not used to thinking about whether the current is or isn't flowing, and that if the current is flowing, we always use V is equal to IR to work out the potential difference. But if the current is not flowing, the question is either, can I read the EMF, in which case it reads the EMF, or can I not? Now, with this equation here, as soon as a current is flowing, you're gonna see next time, we end up with our EMF not being the same as our external voltage. And in your next lesson, I'm gonna discuss with you in great detail what it is in terms of um, the EMF and the lost volts and the, the, the internal resistance and how all of them link together. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're going to call it a day there in terms of our electricity. I'm hoping that everybody found that as much as that was a relatively basic introduction, it reminded you of quite a lot that you'd already forgotten. All right.